take 15 seconds to pause the video, read the question, and then we'll go through the answer. Okay, we have a 17-year-old female who's presenting to an urgent care clinic for a progressively worsening rash. She states that she recently began using a new detergent. Her past medical history is significant for asthma, allergic rhinitis, and several food allergies. Her physical exam reveals diffuse erythematous patches surrounded by excoriations, as well as small vesicles along the popliteal fossa and a cubital fossa and the wrist bilaterally. So now that's kind of a mouthful. Let's kind of break this down a little bit. So at this point in the question, we have a lot of information that's really kind of pushing us in one direction. And I know we haven't really gone through a lot of the different disease processes processes yet, but one of the things we have to consider here, and we're going to talk about this more kind of as we move through this unit, is atopic dermatitis. Now, the classic thing you'll see with atopic dermatitis is usually a lot of these kind of allergen-mediated type processes. So one of them, for example, would be allergic rhinitis, which is very classic. Okay, also asthma is very much classically associated with atopic dermatitis. Food allergies in general can sometimes even be a trigger for an atopic dermatitis type episode. So all of these things are very, very classic and coexistent with this type of diagnosis. Now, one of the other things to the rashes is we got to kind of get comfortable with how do you explain, you know, some of these different rashes, especially as you get into the clinical realm. So in our case, this is initially described as a diffuse erythematous patch. Okay, and there's several of these and they're surrounded by excoriation, as well as small vesicles. And then also the location is always particularly important. So there's certain locations that are very, very classic for a lot of these different disorders. And in this case, the popliteal fossa, the antecubital fossa, and the wrists, generally this kind of distribution is sometimes referred to as the flexor region. We're looking at the elbow here. Okay, so this area is your antecubital fossa. So this is one flexor surface. And then behind the knee, the popliteal fossa is another area in the flexor region that's very classically involved in atopic dermatitis, and then also at the wrist. Okay, at the wrist as well. These locations in general are very much classic for atopic dermatitis when it presents, particularly if there's one area that you want to remember the most, it's usually the antecubital fossa. So if we were to do some, you know, cross section of the skin kind of in this region, okay, so this is just some cross section of skin here. Okay, maybe this is the area, you know, right around the antecubital fossa, for example, and this might be kind of the surface of the skin up here. Okay, so we have these diffuse erythematous patches, okay, on the skin. So these diffuse erythematous patches, maybe there's a couple of them here. And the term patches is also relevant, right? So remember, you know, when you're talking about a macule and a patch, these two are gonna differ in one domain particularly in that macules will tend to be less than or equal to one centimeter and patches will tend to be greater than one centimeter. The key feature that both of these share is they're both flat. If you rub your hand over the skin in that region, you're probably not gonna feel a raised area is basically what we're saying. Now that would be different than a papule, which tends to be raised, okay? or a nodule, which also tends to be raised. And then another term you might see are plaques. Okay, and a plaque is also going to be raised. So then what's the difference between a papule and a nodule, right? So a papule is gonna be less than or equal to one centimeter, right? Same dimensions here. Nodule is gonna be greater than one centimeter. And finally, what's the difference between a nodule and a plaque? Remember, a nodule tends to involve, this tends to involve the dermis. Okay, as we go through this unit, one of the most important things that you have to really kind of laser in on, especially for step one, is not only just understanding some of the basics around the histopathology, but you also need to know where is this pathology taking place. Right? If you push down on a nodule, usually nodules are very firm because a lot of the pathology is happening much deeper, okay, beyond the epidermis, okay, most of it's probably happening in the dermis or maybe in the subcutaneous tissue. Now, plaques, like nodules, are also greater than one centimeter in size, but they don't tend to be as firm and they could have, you know, different types of more rough contour in general than what you would see with a nodule. But that was a quick review, you know, we talked about a lot of this, you know, in the videos already. So going back to our lesion here, we have diffuse erythematous patches, but the patient also has some excoriations as well. Now, whenever you see this term in a question, this is almost like, think of it like a surrogate for itching or paritis, okay? So when you see excoriations, you wanna to start to think about, well, this is probably an itchy lesion. And the reason for that is the excoriations are present because the patient's scratching. So that's something to keep in mind. So this patient also has, you know, some excoriations, maybe from itching this area, so it's very itchy probably. And these are also accompanied by some small vesicles, okay? And we'll talk more about vesicular pathology kind of as we get through the unit. Okay, going back to our patient here. So she started using a new detergent. She has a pretty significant history that would push us in the direction properly of an atopic dermatitis, especially because of the location of the rash. The patients also recommended a topical treatment and referred to a dermatologist. A skin biopsy is later performed and shown below. Okay, so we'll get to this in just a second. Immunostaining of the sample reveals poor expression of E. cadherin within the stratum spinosum. Okay, which of the following is most consistent with the patient's underlying dermatologic disease process. When you're looking at pathology, there are some key things 
things you want to look for because most of the time you're going to be tested on different disease processes in Durham and you should know what a lot of the different histopath at least kind of presents as, so to speak, and where the problem is occurring. Again, is it occurring in the epidermis? Is it in the dermis, the hypodermis sub-Q, you know, in fascia? So those are all the things that you want to kind of be weighing in your mind when you're thinking about this. We can see we have a very clear delineation between the dermis and the epidermis. Okay, so we have a very clear delineation between the dermis and epidermis. So we know that this region here is gonna be the dermis. We'll just put a D for dermis. And we know that this region up here is gonna be the epidermis, okay? And these projections that are kind of finger-like projections that are extending up into the epidermis, these are gonna be the dermal papilla, okay? So that's a dermal papilla kind of extending up into the epidermis. And this whole region, okay, this whole region where you have this kind of like looser connective tissue, this is all going to be your papillary dermis, okay? So remember the dermis is separated into two regions. So the kind of the upper region where you have the dermal papilla and you have the dermal epidermal junction like we just outlined here, this is all gonna be in the region of the papillary dermis. Now beneath this that we can't really see really well is a really large section of dermis that's gonna be made up of the denser fibers and that's the reticular dermis. Okay. For example, if you're talking about a disease process like erysipelas, you might be talking about pathology that's happening kind of more in the papillary dermis. Whereas if you're talking about cellulitis, you might be talking about the pathology being more in the reticular dermis. And these are all the nuances that test writers like to take advantage of. So you do have to know these different locations. All right, now let's just kind of take a look up here in the epidermis. Okay, so I'm kind of just drawing a little area here. So these cells that you're seeing here, kind of in this region, these are actually part of the stratum isali. Okay, so this is kind of like the base layer. Now remember the significance of this layer in particular, when you're talking about pathology, high yield disorders, the big thing is that there's hemidesmosomes. Okay, so hemidesmosomes basically will lock down these epidermal cells and they're gonna do this through intermediate filaments. So let me just kind of draw you a picture of this just so you can kind of see what we're talking about. So we have some cell here. Okay, so remember this cell, it's gonna be anchored down onto a basement membrane. Okay, so that's going to be this thing here. I'll just put BM for basement membrane. Now it's going to be anchored down to that basement membrane via hemidesmosomes. Put HD here for hemidesmosomes. They're going to help anchor the cell to the basement membrane. The hemidesmosomes are not going to help with cell to cell attachments per se. Okay, they're just going to help anchor this down. And these are going to be kind of stabilized here by intermediate filaments. Okay, so hemidesmosomes, and I'll put IF underneath for intermediate filaments, are gonna help anchor the cell down. The important thing to understand here is if you had a pathology for some reason that then damaged the hemidesmosomes, okay? So if you had you know, an antibody or something that bound here that destroyed the hemidesmosomes, what would happen? Well, this layer, okay, the layer that I'm showing you right here, it would essentially get disconnected from the dermis. So you would literally see a huge gap in between the dermis and the epidermis because the hemidesmosomes are no longer able to support and lock that cell down to the basement membrane. And that's exactly what happens when you're talking about bullous pemphigoid, for example. But again, if you just understand the basics here, when we talk about the different pathology, a lot of this stuff is gonna make sense. And then you can even relate the pathology to what you're seeing on the histopath. You can make sense of it. Okay, so that's the stratum basale. And the key feature here is these hemidesmosomes, okay, that you see right here. Okay, now if we go one more layer up from this, I'm just gonna kind of clean this up a little bit. If we go one more layer up, now we're getting into the stratum spinosum. Okay, so the stratum spinosum is gonna be several cell layers thick. Okay, so it's kind of this region that we're looking at here. And if there's one key thing you wanna remember about the stratum spinosum, it's gonna be the function of desmosomes. So again, we just talked about hemidesmosomes having an anchoring function to the basement membrane. When you're talking about anchoring functions between two cells, there's two things you have to know. First, there's desmosomes. Okay, so first there's desmosomes that help perform cell to cell interaction. This is particularly important in which layer? It's particularly important in the stratum spinosum. Okay, so in the stratum spinosum, desmosomes help kind of hold those cells together so they don't rip apart. Okay, so desmosomes are helping to hold these two cells together. And again, this is very similar to hemidesmosomes in that they also use intermediate filaments. Okay, so desmosomes, hemidesmosomes, they both use intermediate filaments. And there's also specific cadherins that help kind of lock this in place. One of the high yield ones that we'll talk about is desmoglein. You can imagine, similarly, if you had a disease process where you generated antibodies to desmoglein or to desmoglein, and it interrupted this for whatever reason, well, now you're gonna have cells that are basically ripping apart. Okay, so that's what would happen if you damaged desmosomes. So we can see here that all of these cells they're pretty much intact, okay? They might be getting stretched a little bit, and we'll explain why that is in just a minute because we have some edema in that area. But if you look a little bit further down, you can see that these cells are actually here things are starting to get a little choppy. Some of these cells maybe aren't connected the same way that they were. You know, the point is when you see areas that are just white, okay, that's indicating that there's nothing there pretty much. So if you have a vesicle or if you have areas where there's no cells, 
particularly in the layer of the stratum spinosum, that might indicate that the desmosomes are probably damaged because those desmosomes were holding a lot of those cells together. We also have another set of junctions here, and that's going to be your zonula adherens, which we talked about a little bit earlier in the chapter. And remember, this uses actin filaments. And then, of course, you have your tight junctions, which don't so much have anchoring functions as they just kind of prevent or can act as a gateway between transfer of substances, you know, between cells. Okay, but the big anchoring functions are primarily going to be through the zonula adherens and the desmosomes. And again, the desmosomes use intermediate filaments, zonula adherens uses actin, and the zonula adherens also has one very, very high yield cadherin, and that's your E cadherins. The CA in the front is referring to calcium. They're calcium mediated proteins that are kind of connecting things, you know, and holding everything together. But let's go back to the questionnaire and just kind of recap some of what's going on. So we have a patient, okay, we have a 17 year old female. She's coming in with what sounds like a very classic description of atopic dermatitis. And we haven't talked about this in great detail, but even if you didn't know that, you can still get this image and make a lot of sense of what's going on. So there's one key finding on this histopath that you want to really pay attention to. And that's the fact, like I said, that you have kind of these white areas here, even in between some of these cells. If we're looking in between some of these cells, we can see areas of white between these cells here. So this is very classic for intercellular edema. It's essentially like having fluid in between these cells. That's why we're kind of seeing these white lines in between here. Now, if we were to zoom in on really high mag here, what we would actually see if we zoomed in really closely is we would actually, in some cases, be able to see the desmosomes between these cells. And the reason for that is because as you add fluid to this area, those cells are starting to receive a little bit of pressure because of all that fluid, and they're starting to kind of get stretched. And the thing that's really holding them together is the desmosomes. And you might be saying, well, hold on a second. You told me that desmoglein and the zonula adherens both held these cells together. So they both should be kind of working at this point with all this edema to hold these cells together. And what you have to be careful here with is remember when they did this immunostaining, they said there's really poor expression of ECAD here and particularly within the stratum spinosum. Poor expression of ECAD here is probably in reference to the fact that the zonal adherence is probably damaged at this point in a case of intercellular edema. Remember this intercellular edema is referred to as spongiosis. Okay, so when you see intercellular edema, you see spongiosis, they're basically saying the same thing. It's almost like this tissue is kind of like a sponge. It has a bunch of these kind of holes in it now, okay, because of all of that fluid. And those holes are telling us that the things that hold the cells together normally, the zonal adherence and maybe even the desmosomes are probably damaged, especially in this area here. You probably have the desmosomes and the adherence junctions damaged. Now, if you were to stain this, okay, if you did immunostaining and you're looking for ECAT here, and the reason you probably don't see a lot of it is because when you have spongiosis, usually this is kind of the first thing to go, so to speak. The zonal adherence is not quite as robust as the desmosomes in the setting of spongiosis, which is kind of beyond the scope. But the reason I bring that up, what makes this really tricky is when you see a question, okay, in general, when you see a question that says there's poor expression of ECAT adherence, many times what they're actually trying to test you on is actually malignancy. Okay, so when you see that there's really low levels of ECAT adherence in a question, it could be because cells are kind of getting ripped apart. That's one option because the zonal adherence helps hold cells together, just like the desmosomes. But the other thing that can happen is in malignancy, you can have decreased expression of E. cadherin. And you're probably saying, okay, that seems like a random fact, but you know, what does that have to do with anything? Think about this, right? So if you had a tumor, okay, if you had a tumor in this area, for whatever reason, okay, so we have some tumor. And remember, a tumor is made up of a bunch of malignant cells, okay? So we have all these malignant cells here. Do you think these malignant cells want to have E. cadherin linking them together really tightly? Probably not, right? They're going to continue to try to replicate and eventually, potentially, get into the bloodstream. Okay, that's what these malignant cells are trying to accomplish. Now, to accomplish that most efficiently, if you downregulate E. cadherin expression, what are you doing? You're taking away the zonal adherence junction. If you don't have that junction, these cells aren't linked together really tight. They're moving all over the place. It's much more likely that these tumor cells can then migrate into the bloodstream at that point. So that's the concerning piece with a malignancy that's downregulating E. cadherin expression. All right, with all that being said, let's go through some of the options here. So the first option, antibody-mediated destruction of hemidesmosomes. We already said, if there was antibody-mediated destruction of hemidesmosomes, we're gonna essentially separate the dermis and the epidermis. So if you had to kind of think about what would that look like, again, that would be basically having a huge white area or some separation between the epidermis and the dermis. If we had a disorder that was targeting the hemidesmosomes. And this is very classic, like we said in bullous pemphigoid, and we'll talk about this kind of as we go through the unit. But this looks like the stratum basale is sitting right on the dermis there. So that's probably not the best answer. Metastatic progression of underlying malignancy. Now, like we said, malignancy very classically will have a downregulation of E. cadherin expression. But remember what E. cadherin is and what it's doing. E. cadherin is cadherin that's used with the zonal adherence. If for whatever reason the integrity of these cell to cell connections are compromised, well, E. cadherin might be much lower. And when you have intercellular edema, like we said, one of the first disruptions is going to be in the zonal adherence. 
appearance. So do you have to know all that to get the question right? Well, not necessarily, but if you go back to the stem, right, this 17 year old female doesn't really have any classic risk factors for malignancy. She just started using a new detergent. She has a very classic presentation for atopic dermatitis. She has a history of food allergies, asthma, allergic rhinitis. This is on the flexor surfaces. It's itchy. You know, it doesn't really strike me as anything that has to do with a metastatic progression of a malignancy. So, you know, we can probably roll that option out. All right, let's jump down to option D here. Antibody mediated destruction of desmosomes. So this would be in reference most likely to a disorder like pemphigus vulgaris, which we'll talk about. Now, if we were to lose the desmosomes here, we probably have huge gaping areas, you know, that are wide open, basically in the epidermis, not between the epidermis and the dermis, but kind of right in the middle of the epidermis, in the stratum spinosum specifically. Why in the stratum spinosum? Because that's the area where we have the majority of the desmosomes. So within the stratum spinosum, we would see huge regions kind of disrupted and just having big white open spaces. That would be very classic if we were destroying all of the desmosomes. And instead we have more of the sponge effect we see with spongiosis, particularly in this region here. And even out here, like I said, between the cells, you can see some intercellular edema. So this is probably, you know, not the best answer. The other thing about pemphigus vulgaris is it happens usually in patients that are 60 or 70 years old. We'll talk about all this as we kind of go through the series. All right, the last option on here is really just a pure distractor, excess production of sebum and androgens. This is largely in reference to acne specifically. We'll talk about acne as we go through this, but we don't really have a hair follicle that we're looking at. We don't have anything specific to acne mentioned in the question. It wouldn't be uncommon in a 17 year old female, but the fact that, you know, she has this progressively worsening rash and it's on the flexor surfaces. She has a history of a lot of IgE mediated pathology. It doesn't sound like a classic case of acne for those reasons. So C is our correct answer, epidermal intercellular edema. And this just goes back to getting comfortable looking at the histopath and just having a general idea of what you're looking at and what part of the skin are we talking about. So in our case, the majority of the pathology is happening here within the epidermis. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with here, just as a bonus item here, we actually kind of talked about this. So as we kind of move up here, we're eventually going to get to the stratum corneum, right? Stratum corneum. And one of the hallmark features of the stratum corneum, it's a nucleate, meaning there's no nucleus in this tissue. We lose the nucleus as these cells kind of migrate up. But what's interesting here is you'll see that, you know, you can see a nucleus here, see a nucleus here, nucleus here. So what's going on here? Why does the stratum corneum have nuclei? So we kind of talked about this. When you see this, this is known as parakeratosis, okay, parakeratosis. That's when the stratum corneum retains nuclei. Now, usually in a question, if they mention parakeratosis, the first thing you think about, the first thing you think about is psoriasis. However, remember that parakeratosis is nonspecific. You can see in a lot of different pathologies. In fact, it's actually very common in cases of spongiosis where patients have, you know, atopic dermatitis or something like that. So parakeratosis is really nonspecific, but if they go out of their way to mention it in a question, or if they say that the stratum corneum is retaining nuclei, that's what they're talking about. And they probably are referencing psoriasis if they're talking about it directly. So just something to keep in mind.